order. Uh, let's stand for the invocation. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the privilege that we have to be here, uh, the privilege you've granted unto us another day. Uh, we are grateful for the, the medical assistance you've provided to our citizens. We're grateful for the services that we're able to provide. May we continue to be good stewards of your resources. Uh, uh, may everything we say and do uh, in this meeting be pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> Roll call, Shelley. Yes, sir. Mike Dobbins. Here. Dora Petskowski. Here. Keith Austin. Here. Danny Callison. Julia Coates. Here. Sean Crittenden. Here. Joe Deere. Here. Rex Jordan. Here. Johnny Here. Kidwell. Here. Daryl Legg. Here. Wes Snowfire. Here. Joshua Sam. Here. Mike Shambaugh. Here. Melvina Shot Pouch. E.O. Smith. Here. Candessa Cheehy. Victoria Vesquez. We have a quorum. Thank you, Shelley. Uh, hopefully you've had a chance to look at the minutes. I'd entertain a motion to approve the minutes. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Motion passes. Moving on to reports from uh, the Claremore Service Unit, Mr. George Valier. Good morning, George. <clears throat> you have my monthly report there in front of you. I'd like to uh, acknowledge our lab. Uh, they received a 2021 IHS Director's Award. Real, real proud of them. Um, they'll be uh, going up next week or this week to uh, receive that up at Rockville. So, uh, real, real proud of them. Giving flu shots and giving uh, COVID vaccinations uh, priority right now. Uh, still testing out front. <clears throat> not, not a lot of uh, flu or COVID hospitalizations, but uh, um, uh, still we 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 are getting some positives. Uh, most of them are cared, sent home and cared for at home. Um, collections were up. Collections doing well. As you can see, um, and any particular questions as we go forward? Questions for George. Uh, George, uh, how many service units uh, operate out of the Oklahoma City area office? Do you happen to know? The federals, there are five, five of us left. Claremore, Lawton, <coughs> Wewoka, Pawnee, Clinton okay, and so Haskell up in Lawrence, Kansas. Yeah. Okay, so the Lawrence operates out of the Oklahoma yes. City. Yes, sir. So Tallahena is within the Choctaws. Ch now. That's tribal, yes. Yeah, okay. All right. Are you having, continue having difficulty with uh, the dental assistants, hiring dental assistants? They hired two, and they're still advertising. So hopefully that, uh, uh, that should pick up. That, that's a focus there at the hospital. Okay. Well, I know you have to, uh, given your location, you have to somewhat compete with the Tulsa market, uh, dental assistant market. Yes, sir. We added a, a, a recruitment incentive to uh, try to entice some dental assistants to, to uh, sign on with us. Uh -huh. Because it still looks like, uh, I guess, due to the dental assistant shortage, it's still kind of inhibiting your access it is because uh, just crunching the numbers looks like your hygienist are seeing about three patients a day that's what it looks like yeah yes. and some of the dentist uh, well you, you're seeing 13 dental assistants a day I don't know exactly how many dis you maybe maybe your dentist are only seeing like two patients a day so i just noticed the numbers and I, I see okay I, I agree okay thank you um any other questions for George? Okay, thank you, George. Thank you. Dr. Jones, Dr. Stephen Jones. Good morning. Good morning. 
Well, I am not. I know you guys have got a busy schedule and you're trying to get a lot done today, so I'm not going to uh, talk a lot about the report. It's in your packet. I do have a few things I want to talk about. Uh, I think last week, I don't see Dr. Uh, Mr. Callison here, but um, he asked about the left without being seen average jumped up quite a bit on our graph. I uh, went back and looked at that. Uh, it did jump up, but if you look at the graph, it's a pretty small number. We went from a one and a half average per day on a month to 3.5. So, you know, it is a jump, but you also got to look at volume. So if you look at percentages overall, maybe that's the way we should be reporting it as percentages instead of raw numbers, because the raw numbers don't take into account how many people are in the waiting areas. And some of that can be the fact that we are starting to try to divert people away from the urgent care and ER over to the clinic when clinic hours are open. Uh, a lot of people use our urgent care and ER like a primary care, and they just go when they want to go. And we're trying to educate people that they need to get a primary care provider and be seen in our clinics rather than use it that way. So just wanted to call attention to that. Uh, the other thing I want to call attention to, I know there's been a little bit of uh, social media around it this weekend. Uh, we did open up an RSV uh, pediatric clinic uh, in association with our um, urgent care, and we're doing that because the numbers are going through the roof on RSV. Um, some people believe it's because we didn't have really an RSV um, issue last year, and this is kind of catching up because of all the uh, things we were doing for COVID, wearing masks and things of that nature, and and uh, now the immunity may not be there where it was before. So our numbers jumped from uh, four weeks ago. We were seeing about 295 um, visits on kids, zero to one, jumped up to 477 in a week, so as a 30% increase, which was overwhelming our urgent care and ER dealing with these uh, types of illnesses. So in response to that, our pediatric department and our urgent care stepped up and made a fast track for kids to go through and uh, get them seen quicker and get them out of the normal the waiting area um, for normal urgent care and ER. So our hours for that, normally our normal urgent care hours are 8 a.m. to 12 p.m., uh, seven days a week. The uh, temporary pediatric Fast track, if so, you, so to speak, is uh, 8 to 8 Monday through Friday and 12 to 5 on the weekends and holidays. So we've been able to staff it for uh, not only uh, the weekends but for the holidays too. So we're going to continue this as long as we see these metrics, these numbers high. Um, normally RSV lasts about four to five weeks, um, and we're about two to three weeks behind the East Coast as this comes across. They're in week six and they're still at their peak. So um, this may last a while, and so we're ready. We're gonna you know, stay hooked up until we see a decrease in the numbers and get them back down to normal, and then we'll pull those people back. And I uh, just wanna let you guys all know about that, because I know there was a, I saw a lot of stuff on Facebook going around about a lot of positive things and some negative, feeling like we needed to do that for other uh, groups too. So I uh, just wanted to point that out. Because of that, and you, as you know, we are short-staffed. We have had a lot of people leave the health system during COVID. We're still replenishing those jobs. We're still looking for nurses. We're still looking for all those to replace those health care workers that just decided that they'd had enough and retired. So when you ask for something for us to come and cover a community event or something like that, we are trying to cover every single thing we can but just know that we are short-staffed and we may have to pull back in some areas because we're covering this now. Uh, and we're utilizing resources from all of our clinics. We're offering incentives for people to come and work these extra shifts. Um, so just, just know, I just wanna let you know that we try to say yes to every single request, but there may come a time that we just cannot physically staff it. So other than that, um, can't say enough about our staff and you know the willingness for them to step up and we had this need and we put out the the call and we had people all over the system stepping up and coming up with solutions so we were able to put this together pretty quickly within a few days and get everything moved to a new area in the hospital that we had were planning on renovating um, and we've got that set aside so people can go directly to that keep them out of the waiting room of the uh, urgent care and ER normal waiting room area so uh, can't say enough about them I mean they are just stepped up in every way possible and they've done that for the last two and a half years and so proud of them 
and it's humbling to to work with such a great group of people that are willing to answer the call anytime we ask. So with that, I'll answer questions. Questions for Dr. Jones? Sean. Sean. Yeah, Doc, while we're talking about that, um, RSV, what, what do they treat those with? Uh, you're what really, kind of medicine there? You're really just treating the symptoms. There's not a vaccine for it. So it's uh, it's really just treating the symptoms, and it depends on, on the situation. If it's severe enough, we have to admit them and do, you know, respiratory treatments in the hospital. So it's just uh, it depends on the severity and how early you catch it and, and what's going on. It is contagious, so it can transmit to an adult. It uh, doesn't happen near as often, but it can. And, uh, you know, one thing that we can all do is do what we can to stay out of those situations, stay out of the urgent care, stay out of, uh, out of the clinics if we don't need to be there by doing our due diligence, doing our vaccines and our flu vaccines and things of that nature to allow more efforts to go toward where, where we're really needed. So being around kids a lot, um, you know, some cough pretty bad, have these different symptoms. Uh, how does that compare like to COVID? We wanted them there. If you had some symptom, test them. Is that like RSV or? They have a test for it and they will test them and they do test when they come in. But uh, what's the overall uh, outlook as far as as soon as they start coughing, you better go get tested or how does How's the health world looking at that? Because, you know, COVID, we wanted to get them tested and yeah. you're having symptoms. I think, uh, you know, in my opinion, if, you, if, if the child's sick and, you know, you want to get them tested, bring them in, let's test them, let's get them treated early. Uh, earlier treatment's better than, than waiting too long. Um, most, most parents are going to be a little on the, um, and even in school, school nurses are very, you know, in tune to any kind of little thing that pops up right now because of COVID. So... Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think so. I think we need to get them checked out. I mean, especially right now when we're at the height of this, because we're seeing it all over the place, and we're right, and we're still on the incline. You know, we're still seeing the numbers increase week to week. Um, we've have I don't think we've hit our peak yet. So yeah, if I think if there's a, you know, if there's any question at all, it'd be better to be safe than sorry. Bring them in, let's test them. And our pediatric department's making every effort they can to bring them <coughs> into the clinic. They've got same days in the clinic. Like I said, we've got this fast track in the uh, urgent care now, so we're opening up as much access for that as we possibly can. Sure, appreciate yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Melvina? Uh, what age group is really affected, the infant or? It can, you know, I asked that's question this morning of some of our medical staff and uh -huh. you know most of them told me 10 to you know 0 to 10 to 12 but we're seeing the biggest number increase in 0 to 1 that's where the biggest numbers that we're seeing uh, and sometimes the older kids they don't necessarily bring them in it's a they treat it's cold and going down the road but uh, the biggest increase that we're seeing with diagnosis of RSV is 0 to 1 so mainly infants and small children Uh, Dr. Jones, uh, I noticed in the report says 78 babies were delivered. Uh, is that is that about a normal month? This time of year, it gets high. <laughs> uh, seems to, and and then uh, you know we are dealing with um, our hospital down the road, uh, mm -hmm. Northeastern Health Systems has been on divert a lot, so we're seeing a lot. You know, when they go on divert, then we take pick up the slack. So if someone shows up there and they don't have the staffing to be able to see them. They send them to our hospital and we treat them and take care of them. So that's part of our um, responsibility to the community and responsibility to to the general public. And you know, as far as uh, uh, we treat them if they come in. So that's we're got that partnership going with them. And so we've seen that increased number because of that. Can you just kind of expand what our coverage, what kind of uh, coverage we have in OB? Do we have, how many OB doctors do we have? Do you know? Mm, I don't know off the top of my head. We have, because uh, we have mid-levels in, in there too, and we're unique because we have midwives also. Midwives. So uh, I can't give you that. I can get you that number, but I don't, okay. I'd hate to quote it and not be accurate on it because it's, uh, we do have a high number of OB docs. We have plenty of docs to cover everything. We have, we're on call all the time. So uh, typically our numbers increase around last part of August to around this time. Uh, September usually is where our peak is. That's usually our biggest month every year. Uh, but yeah, we and I think we did a little, right around 100 or a little over 100 in September. So uh, 
uh, deliveries. So it's down a little bit, but still high. 78 is still a lot. Do other health systems have midwives within their system? Do you know? I, I don't know that they do typically. I think mm -hmm. that's unique to us. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions for Dr. Jones? And we continue being a nurse, nursing shortage, which is acute shortage everywhere. Absolutely. Still. We're looking at everything outside the box from incentives to um, longevity bonuses to um, we're working with career services on a, um, a pathway to get nurses trained uh, quicker through a, I won't, you know, I'm going to simplify it and say kind of like an apprentice program where a nurse can get trained and move her level of um, uh, abilities up faster. Uh, so we're working with Diane Kelly's bunch uh, in career services to make a grant happen that would allow that us to be able to do that here on the on the reservation. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Jones. All right. Thank you. From Public Health, Ms. Lisa Pivek. Hello, Lisa. So everybody preparing for that, but I'm happy to see you and thank you for having us today. Um, you have my report. I have a couple of things to highlight on the report. Um, one of the things, FAB is still reviewing all of our documentation. Um, we did receive an email that they will be getting back with us at the first of the year, and that is for our reaccreditation for uh, from the Public Health uh, Accreditation Board. We have started another initiative that works with the Public Health Accreditation Board and the Choctaw, Chickasaw, Muscogee Nations to assess and build a tribal regional public health system so that we can see how each of us, each tribe can contribute to one another um, to see how we can build a stronger for the eastern Oklahoma, northeast Oklahoma. Um, in CDC, some updates uh, that are not on the report, um, Deputy Chief Warner and myself are still working on the Tribal Advisory Committee, and one of the charges that the Tribal Advisory Committee now has is also working with CDC has been charged to come up with a policy on data sovereignty and releasing um, tribal data to tribal epidemiology centers across the nation. And we're weighing in on that, uh, making sure that all of our tribal data is protected um, this is not just for CDC, but it's for other HHS agencies as well, and that policy will be in development for a little bit. It's in response to the GAO report about access to tribal epidemiology centers, which are tribal organizations um, versus tribal, actually tribal, sovereign tribal nations. So we've been working pretty closely on that and been on some calls. Um, let me check and see. The, in um, surveillance and monitoring, as you guys know, every two, every other year we do, we participate in CDC's Youth Behavioral Risk Monitoring System, in which we um, do the Youth Behavioral Risk Survey in schools across the reservation. We received the results of that back from CDC this past month, and we are preparing an, a report for you for next month. Dr. Gann, by the way, is out ill today, so he's not available to be here, but next month we'll present those findings to you. And um, since we've been doing this for quite a while, we have some good comparisons from 2010 onward to take a look at. And this looks at all kinds of youth, youth reported behaviors, uh, vaping, smoking, alcohol use, depression, suicidal ideation, uh, fruits and vegetable consumption, exercise, lots of those risk factors for chronic disease. Um, so that it's pretty insightful when we get that for you. Um, on the WIC program, a couple of just quick notes. Um, preparing for summer EBT again, so that will be starting before we know it. And we're also working on a seniors EBT program for farmers market. That will be available this season as well. And that is going to be available across the reservation. And I'll have more details on that, but it's very similar in that um, we'll be able to issue seniors cards uh, qualify for uh, to use at farmers markets um, in the future. Um, on cooperative and grants, we just received a new WIC infrastructure grant in the last month. Um, it's just to help build the um, system, the electronic system, electronic benefits system across the nation, and we are working with this other tribes and other states to do that. Um, we have turned in another, we just turned in another application for a new grant this last week. 
We are working on three to four that are in the process for the early 2023, including the AmeriCorps and other opportunities with um, other divisions that we want to submit together with. If you notice on the wings numbers, um, I thought they were pretty interesting up to now. If you'll take a look at those, um, we're you know close going close to 10,000 participants, but it's pretty much half and half virtual versus, versus in person. So keeping the virtual has proved beneficial. It's increased the numbers, and um, I, I see that people really uh, enjoy that virtual option, and we'll continue to do that. Um, this week is the uh, National Great American Smokeout, in which we will be um, having events going on around the reservation. Um, we recommend, we, we do offer classes. Um, right now they're not virtual, but we're working on trying to get those virtual. Um, the curriculum that we're trained in, American Lung Association, that all of our staff are, have training and certification in, we're working to see how best to put that um, on a virtual option. We do refer everyone to 1-800-QUIT-NOW, and that's a national number. So anywhere you are in the country, if you call 1-800-QUIT-NOW, they can refer you to a service, a, a phone service that also delivers um, over-the-counter nicotine replacement therapy, the gums and the patches. Um, for free to anybody that calls it. There are native, uh, certain staff trained directly to deal with native populations and to work with native populations. Um, and we're also completing a training so that we can offer youth cessation, tobacco cessation programs quickly, soon. Um, as you know, this is National Diabetes Month. I know the Health Division's got a great deal of events planned. Um, we have walks planned at each of the facilities. Um, and we'll be partnering with a special diabetes program for Indians to do whatever um, projects that they need us to do during that time. Um, we are also working on, let's see, uh, there's a lot of stuff in this that deals specifically with your county and your educators. So if you have questions about any of those, be happy to get back with you offline about those. And um, the, if, as you notice, the public health educators have a variety of things they do aside from our regular um, host of things that we offer, they do specific to their area. Uh, and, uh, School Health and Wellness, we're revisiting that grant program. We'll have the grant application out early this year. Um, we haven't changed it in many years, but this year we're looking at changing it up a little bit, maybe coordinate it more. One of the things is thinking about coordinating more with the Youth Behavioral Risk Survey and a program that CDC uh, offers called Getting to the Why and working with schools on that. And the last thing I mentioned is community outreach uh, for our community health workers. You'll notice that they um, reached out to 224 tribal citizens and those connecting those to every program that's available within the tribe, if it's um, home rehab, if it's something with human services, something with education, something with career services, um, whatever they need, trying to get those applications and walk them through the process in that. We also have a work with health services, and health services has a great process that we're able to work with someone from each facility for anyone out in the community that needs that assistance. Um, we're currently working on a, a, a more comprehensive referral system with each division so that we can make those more expedient and be able to offer more assistance. And of course, we work with uh, the language program on this initiative as well. That's what I have, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have today. Questions for Lisa? All right. Lack of inquiring minds. All guess, right. Lisa. Have a happy right. Thanksgiving. Thank you, Lisa, for your report. Okay. I see no old business pending nor new business pending. In the announcements, just the next meeting is tentatively scheduled for Monday, December the 12th at 1230. Need one more motion. Okay, I have a motion and a second to adjourn. All those in favor? Okay, we're, we're, we're adjourned.